the research is really starting to come out that like the difference between people who are able to control their weight throughout their lifetime and not people who struggle with their weight isn't that one hour session in the gym it has nothing to do with that it's your total amount of movement throughout your day it's how much non-exercise activity you're getting so you know oftentimes it's a big you know it's a big rake that sort of gym goers are stepping on thinking that you know man i got this i went to my crossfit class but it turns out you burn like 300 calories at a crossfit class Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pekulski. Thank you very much for joining me. Today's podcast is another remarkable conversation on everything you need to be doing to optimize how well you move. Sometimes movement is complicated. Sometimes it seems like it's overwhelming. It may seem daunting. It certainly seems like there's a million different ways to approach how you look at mobility, how you look at movement optimization, depending on where you currently are, what your goals are, what your lifestyle allows. Kelly and Juliet Sturette join me today to discuss their brand new book that has just launched that I'm going to highly suggest and I'm highly going to believe every one of you is going to want to pick up at the end of this podcast. Just an incredible dive into how to integrate simple objective movements into your daily routine and ultimately how to objectify movement and progress in your life. As we age, we are losing our mobility. We're losing our physical capability unless you're absolutely massively intentional about keeping those walls from closing in around you. And Kelly and Juliet do an incredible job of simplifying a really, really potentially complex area, giving us highly actionable insights into ultimately how we can move well right now uh, and for the rest of our lives. And if you're not already someone who's an enormous advocate or at least incredibly aware of the vitality or the necessity of moving really, really well, as we age, this podcast will bring that to your awareness and so much more. Thank you so much to Juliet and Kelly for writing this book. Thank you for being guests in the podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors for today. Our longtime sponsor of the podcast, Buy Optimizers, one of the companies that I use religiously because I can rely on the quality of their products. You'll never see a day where I'm not using mass times, where I'm not using magnesium breakthrough, where I'm not using their sleep product just because I know I can rely on what actually it says on the label is in the product and what actually is on the label is known to be the efficacious dose that actually works. So regardless of what challenge you're experiencing in life or what problem you're solving for with supplements, Bioptimizers has an incredible product for you. This month, Bioptimizers wants to feature Magnesium Breakthrough. And if you're a listener of this podcast and you're not already using Magnesium Breakthrough, go ahead right now and head over to magbreakthrough.com slash muscle, or just go to magbreakthrough.com and use the code muscle10 to get hooked up with 10% off your uh, order, your entire order of Magnesium Breakthrough, Masszymes, Capex, and now they've got an incredible array of additional products that I'm a fan of, from Nootropics to um, P3OM, which is an incredible probiotic that our friend and guest, previous guest of the podcast, Matt Gallant, has told us so much about. Once again, that's magbreakthrough.com slash muscle intelligence or slash muscle, both will work for you to get your incredible products and ultimately put the best into your body. You know, we, we, filter what you guys are exposed to. We test what we bring to this product, what we bring to this podcast, because we want to uh, retain your trust, retain your loyalty, and ultimately support only brands that are bringing us the best quality ingredients and the best quality products. So thank you very much to Buy Optimizers for being our sponsor, and thank you for being here. Thank you to Kelly and Juliet. And now let's get right back to this episode, with Kelly and Juliet Sturet, and how to move your body well. So I love that you guys came with a new book. Super excited to dive in. And, and it's what we need right now, right? So it's, it's really funny that one of yeah. my clients recently asked me, he's like, hey man, do you have any protocol for like unwinding all the sitting I do every day? And I was like, you know, I just might be interviewing some people tomorrow on a podcast. <laughs> that. Perfect timing. I was like, okay. Like, I might have like, someone. Exactly. We need to dissect this and like, what it, what is the what is the process? So we can just get rolling. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say yeah. around do it unwinding well so maybe, maybe reversing into that the idea behind writing the book why you guys did it, i love that you guys did it together and what are maybe the problems you're solving with this book well i'll tell you what 
first thing first is if you know we have been in this space for a long time working with really tremendous teams and athletes and big organizations like the army trying to untangle musculoskeletal problems in it's very clear that if we're really going to try to sort of embody the idea of sports and performance as a laboratory, then we need to take those lessons and transform them and transmute them into the lives of mortals like Juliet and I and our, the people in our neighborhood and the more people we work with. Otherwise, sport and that la sports laboratory is a big shiny object where we get really complex and it's super sexy and we do all these cool things and then it's just entertainment and we can we can make that deal with the with the devil i think that's fine but we've always felt like the reason we understand what we understand the reason we're all focusing on sleep so much and whole food nutrition and sort of all of these ideas around sort of durability is that all of that has come out of working with athletes because that that's a really intense sort of place where we can see a lot of stress, we can really measure as inputs and outputs, and we can we have this sort of discrete kind of confined laboratory. So here we are, 20 years into this experiment. Fitness is now a trillion dollar industry. And if we looked around, one of the things we saw was that we're not really serving people very well. Obesity, diabetes, back pain, surgeries, substance abuse, depression, I mean, choose something you give a crap about or something that's happened to your family and ask, is it getting better? Are we seeing less prevalence of this? And the answer is unequivocally no. So adding greater complexity into the system isn't working. We haven't taken this systems approach. We have given people little shiny objects to chase. And subsequently, people are highly confused and it's not working. So uh, a sort of reframing of approach has really been what we've been one of the the metrics and the reasons we attempted to write this book to try to see if we could improve the ball a little bit if we could sort of clean up some of the mess that you know we've all made and then Juliet has probably some other uh, other reasons well i i would say that one of the other motivations for writing this book in the first place was as you know we owned a gym for 15 16 years and you know we got to see sort of you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of the sort of weekend warrior type of athlete coming through our gym every day. And we had some of the most exceptional coaches working for us. And what we saw is that our clients would come in for these one hour sessions and our coaches had planned in advance, you know, this program and they're going to do A, B and C and work on X, Y and Z. And then oftentimes those clients would come in completely not ready for that training session. They were stressed. They hadn't slept. They hadn't eaten breakfast. They haven't eat, hadn't eaten a vegetable in the last week. They probably hadn't moved their body enough. They'd done a ton of sitting. And so we saw that our coaches, while they were able to help people in that one hour session where they were working with them, you know, as a, in a formal one hour session as a coach, they were really able to make some impact on their strength and fitness. There were still 23 other hours of the day where our coaches weren't really able to support their clients. But, and what we wanted to do was give a manual for coaches to be able to say, hey, I can work with you on your strength and your cardiovascular fitness. And, you know, there's a lot we can accomplish in this formal one hour block at the gym. But here's what you need to be thinking about and doing for the other 23 hours of the day. And not only to feel better so that but also so that when you do come into the gym and show up for the training sessions you do with me, they're going to be much higher quality. We're going to get more out of those training sessions where you're going to feel better in your body and you'll have higher output and be able to d adapt to the training we're doing better. You know, th that was another motivator for us. You, you know, Supple Leopard is epic. It's one of the, you know, it's it's obviously a legendary book out there, but, you know, very few coaches or people who are health and fitness enthusiasts are going to be able to say to, you know, their weekend warrior athlete friends or their parents or their neighbors, like, hey, here, uh, you know, want to feel better in your body? Here's a copy of Supple Leopard, right? It's a bit too complicated and and, you know, serious and, you know, really speaking to sort of an athlete PT coach niche. And we want to be able to create something where that we could hand out to our friends and families and the coaches could hand out to their clients that was really accessible and could really move the needle for people in, you know, all the other hours of the day where they're not doing formal training. Love it. And what I've noticed in my own personal experience is, you know, as I get older, even the smallest amount of movement outside of my, you know, 90 to two hour, 90 minute two hour workout 
makes a massive difference to how I show up in that session. So if I can learn to become intentional about the specific movements that work most effectively for me, I can show up with a gym, not only with a higher ceiling, but with a, with a, with a shorter runway. Like it take, doesn't take me as much time to get going and actually be more effective in my love training. That. Very true. Yeah. So I love the fact that, you know, we can give someone a, a book like uh, Built to Move and start like, hey, here's your, here's your protocol. Let's start walking through like, what is the problem we're solving in this? You know, specifically, if we look at the body, you know, what was the, the framing you guys took on in the book? One of the things that we're seeing a lot of is everyone has some secret squirrel program. And ultimately, we're agnostic, completely agnostic. We think the hyper-local coach, the coach at the, at the sort of unit session where they're working with someone, that person knows that athlete, knows their environment, knows their training age, knows their history, knows what tools they have available. So knows what their skill set is, has all of that context. So we're, we're not huge fans of saying, we think everyone should swing kettlebells or everyone should barbell lift or everyone should train this way. We're like, if you like to train that way, that's cool. Yep. Comma, we also think that your training and your the way you're organizing your physical practice should be able to be third-party validated. So if you're training a certain way, I Peloton, Peloton is the thing. I loved indoor cycle. Cool. Can you extend your hip? No. You can't extend your hip anymore. You can't get into a lunge shape. Your butt turns off when anytime your knee goes behind your back. Now, suddenly we can say, well, hey, that training is introducing a specific session cost. It is re removing your movement choice. It is shutting down your movement options and your available sort of native physiology. So we don't have to have an argument that cycling is good or bad. What we can say is cycling, the way you're doing it, is imposing a real cost on the way your brain's giving you access, whether it's tissue stiffness or just that your your brain's guarding or you haven't been there. It doesn't matter what the mechanism is, right? But ultimately, we think that you should be able to say, whatever you like to do, come in and at least hit these benchmarks, hit these vital signs of established around either sort of behavioral interventions, because half of this book is sort of wrapped around behavioral vital signs, and the other half around movement vital signs around. And what the, what it means is that you're like, I'm keto. I'm like, super cool. Do you get enough protein in the day? Are you eating fruits and vegetables and fiber? Do you sleep? It's, it doesn't matter what where you're coming from, but at least now what we've done is tried to establish what we know to be the smallest sort of hinges that open the biggest doors across all of the athletic and durability, longevity sort of lifespan, health span. And, and so what we tend to do here is give people these benchmarks so that you can start to say, well, I really like to power lift, but man, I've gotten stiff or I like to eat this certain way, but it's not really serving me in this long haul. We can then make adjustments to that. But what we haven't done for people writ large is given people these benchmarks and clear sort of objective measurements where it's not, I feel good and uh, you know my, my cool super blast secret school program is better than yours. Well, can you prove it? And now what we've done is taken these clear scientific bass backed research supported vital science and then handed them over to the people and trusting them to be able to integrate them into their lives. We've also really tried to simplify the idea of mobility in this book and explain it really in terms of movement and the ability to do things you want to do. And so we have really updated our thinking and definition of mobility to be, you know, can you move freely in your body without pain? And can you do the things you want to do with your body? And, you know, people have very wide ranging goals in terms of what they want to do with their body, but it doesn't matter who you are. People still want to be able to move their body through their environment freely and with with less pain, you know, pain is part of the human condition. We'll all experience aches and pains. And, you know, anyone who's, you know, turning into their, you know, late 30s, 40s, 50s knows that that's a reality. But, you know, as Kelly likes to say, pain really in many cases isn't always a medical problem. And there's so request for change, request for change. And there are so many things that we can do in terms of care and feeding of our body to make ourselves feel better now and in the long in the long haul. Okay. I really want to emphasize, I really want to emphasize what you said, Kelly, uh, like all movement has a potential benefit and a potential cost. And I don't think everyone thinks about it that way. And, and so mm -hmm. 
you know, in, in what I teach or what I did historically, bodybuilding, you know, isolating of muscles. I, I try to make sure people realize like when you isolate muscles, you're ultimately creating dysfunction, right? We're literally like, we're, we're uh, isolation is creating dysfunction on purpose. Like I, I want to isolate this thing so that it gets bigger, but it's not actually making it more functional. It's making it less functional at the end of the day, de- you know, depending on the, the And the let me be super clear, being jacked and tan is super cool. <laughs> Totally. We're, yeah. we're down with that. And you're, but you're creating dysfunction. So you have to be aware of like, okay, what level can I approach for this to mm. before the other things around it starts to ultimately fall behind or I need to, I need to shift my attention to something else. So every movement has a potential massive upside and benefit. And if you're, if you're conscious of it, it can have a potential downside. So I love the fact that you guys are kind of highlighting that and then giving us the tools to go, okay, well, here's how you need to identify when that starts to happen. So, man, fantastic. So, can we start to walk through what those things are? You said you're giving us some objective measures. That's that's incredibly fascinating to me. Well, and I just want to add one point on on what you said before, just about the compromises. You know, I think for, you know, everyday athletes, weekend warrior type folks who might be listening to this, those compromises are always really obvious in professional athletes, right? If you look at Tour de France cyclists, they have these gigantic quads and lower bodies and then like skeleton upper bodies. You know, you look at Michael Phelps's body is like perfectly designed for swimming. And so, you know, seeing those physical compromises when we're talking, you know, when we're looking at athletes at the highest level of sport is so obvious to people. But I think you're exactly right. Like your everyday athlete and mover isn't thinking that the, their sport, whether that's Peloton, powerlifting, bodybuilding, CrossFit, uh, it is also, you know, uh, creating a lot of compromises in their body. And, you know, again, it, it gives them an opportunity to start to think about, you know, think about those compromises they're making differently and what kind of inputs they need to put in, into their bodies. We're trying to help people and we'll get into some of the, the nitty gritty, but we're trying to help people find their blind spots. I think everyone can appreciate that they're not running a perfect program. We're not professional athletes. Very few of us can say my job 24 hours a day is to think about sport and train myself for sport. That's very different. And if you are, I trust me, we know you. we're working together and it's gnarly life. The rest of us have families and are busy and we're just, and if you carve out an hour or plus to train three to five times a week, that is heroic. I mean, and you are a, just such a small percentage, but the average person is like, well, Hey, I've been told I need to breathe hard and I bre- breathe hard. So isn't that enough? Right. I went to, I went to my, you know, my, my booty pump class and I mean, I, I don't understand. I, that's enough. How do you know, Kelly? I didn't know I did well, because I, I'm into booty pump. <laughs> And, um, you know, we were just on a, a big NPR show and a woman called in and was really irate because she dances, she gardens, and she was having a hard time getting up and down off the ground. And she thought that we were being aegist and what we were asking her to do was dangerous. And what we didn't say, we really were like, hey, woman, keep moving, doing what you're doing. But she found this blind spot in her ability to flex her hip and get up and down off the ground independently. And what I wanted to do was quote, you know, our friend Lane Norton at her. I'm like, sorry, the data is bigger and, and more robust than your feelings, ma'am. <laughs> and really that that piece though, you know, really highlights this this notion that what we should be doing is saying, hey, we have these tests that we can run these vital signs, which I don't have to test every day, but allows me to touch base and see what the cost is of, of what it is I'm doing. So here's this woman who thinks she's killing it and yet she can't get up and down off the ground independently. And the number one reason people end up in nursing homes is they can't get up and down off the ground independently. The number one predictor of like mortality and more early morbidity is not being to be independent as you move through space. So what we're doing here with the objectivity, you know, when, when we wrote Supple Leopard, you know, we, we believe strongly in observable, measurable, and repeatable phenomenon. In fact, a model is defined as you know, can it explain current phenomenon? Can it predict current phenomenon? And can it be repeatable? And so when we wrote Supple Leopard, the objective measures there are one, range of motion, which is really not, is like the most standard. Everyone thinks the hip should move within five degrees of this range of motion. The shoulder does this thing. Every orthopedic surgeon on the planet agrees. Every physician, physical therapist agrees. And then the other thing was biomotor output, wattage, poundage. Those things are unequivocal. That's how we measure how well you're using your shoulder when you bench, right? Bench goes up. So we took those ideas of objectivity, which was really lacking in health. You know, when people talk about longevity and longevity 
sort of behaviors, there are very few objective measurements in that context. Sounds great. I want to live for a thousand years. Totally. I want to be immortal. I don't want to die, but you know, I want to live on and on. Well, how do I do that? And how do I measure my progress? So by giving people these objective measures, then what we've been able to do is establish benchmarks. So if I say to you, your blood pressure is 120 over 80, everyone's like, okay, that's, that's fine. It's not great blood pressure. It's also not terrible blood pressure. It gives us a reference mark. So we sort of now can go into red, yellow, green. I need to uh, pay attention on this. So we, we start open the book with this simple hip range of motion test. It is not, you don't need ankle dorsiflexion. We've taken the ankles out of it. You don't have to have full hip flexion. You don't even need to be able to bend your knees up very much, but people struggle to sit cross-legged and get up off the ground mm -hmm. from that position. And by the way, that is not even a full range of motion position. Full range of motion test is doing a pistol. Can you get up and down off the ground in a pistol position? That's full dorsiflexion, full, full hip flexion. And yet what we said was, hey, too hard. Let's go ahead and establish this. So if, if when we open the book with this, one of our intentions is for athletes, they'll probably find that this book, if you're really into fitness, you'll probably have one or two blind spots. How do we know? Because all of the world champions we handed this book to had one or two blind spots and you're probably not a world champion. So the rest of it though- it Might even be like three or four. <laughs> I get, struggle to eat enough protein every day. I mean, there, there you go. So, you know, what we see is we now have a way of taking an olive branch and being more inclusive with our families. We want all the athletes and all the people who are training and, and into this world to suddenly say, it's up to me to rescue my family. It's up to me to, to bring my uncles and aunties and household along with my obsessive fitness journey, even though, look, my grandma, you know, or my mom is not going to deadlift. You know, there's some things that are going to happen, but I can start to say, hey, look, here are some measures we can now get into ways to improve your range of motion, ways to make your hips function better, et cetera, et cetera, by initiating this conversation through objective measures. Would you say, so it sounds like door number one, right? The way I think of it is like door number one is sit, sitting on the, leg, on the ground with your legs crossed. So the inability to do that, does that prevent or restrict what you should do next in, in your judgment? Is that, is that kind of what we're getting at? So if I can't sit on the ground with my legs crossed. And it's not even that. Probably... It's not sitting on the ground. It's getting up and down off the ground without using your, putting your knee down mm -hmm. and your hands down, right? That's, it's really the expression. It's not just a range of motion. It's can you express this mid-range range of motion in something that's useful and physical? Right. So I, I can picture, you know, a handful of people that I know that can't do that. And so if they were my, if they were your client, what would be the, like, okay, you can't do this. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go on and do that. Let's regress it and work on this. The first thing to keep in mind is that Juliet and I are parents. We are busy working people. We don't have thousands of hours to meal prep and do all the things we do that, you know, fitness Instagram tells us we need to do. And so when we look at behavior and we look at trying to get people to re reduce the barriers to adherence and get people to do what they need to do, we have to look at the, when they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And behavior change is the game in fitness and behavior health, right? It, that's the thing. How do we make it more sticky? How do we have people come back for a training session? How do we show them progress, et cetera? The first order of business is to say, when can people do these things, right? Hey, I need you to take off your dress in the middle of the workday and sit on the floor in the middle of your office. That's never going to happen. No one is going to do that in the history of the world. And it, how do we know? Because it hasn't happened. People don't do that. You're going to be that guy in the office. Don't be that guy in the office. So what we found though, is that we, there are times and what we have in this book is this thing called the 24 hour duty cycle, where we have definite increased moments of agency in the morning, in the evening, where we can start to stack these behaviors. And just like, again, we're coaches and trainers. We've been doing this for a long time. If you want to get better at the bike, we don't do a lot of talking and bike skill transfer exercises and we get on the bike and you are going to suck, but you're going to get on the bike and we're going to start working at being better on the bike. We're going to start working on intervals and skill and breathing and all those things. The first order of magnitude sort of behavior change is exposure. So if someone is struggling to sit on the ground cross-legged, you know what they need to do for 10 minutes in the evening while they're watching TV? Wait for it. Sit on the ground cross-legged. Let's get you started. And then to spend have time to get back up again. So- huh. 
what we can start to say is, okay, we need you to spend time on the ground. Oh, and then you're also 90-90. And then you can sit cross-legged. And then you can sit long sit. But what we know is that there's that time in the evening where you're not doing anything else where we can put insert that behavior and that relative consistent exposure where we can start to make change. Well, and I, I just want to see if I can address your specific question, which I, th I think was, you know, if, if someone, let's say you're a coach working with a client and they're not able to get up and down off the floor, should their program or what they're doing be adjusted? And and I guess I'll I'll answer that a little bit by saying that the the most difficult vital sign for me is the squat test. I have horrible ankle dorsiflexion. And you're a three time world champion. But yeah, interestingly, I was a you know D one rower at Cal. I you know went on to be a paddler and win three world championships. You know I competed in the CrossFit Games in 2010. So my ankle dorsiflexion didn't necessarily stop me from being able to do the, my, my poor ankle dorsiflexion didn't necessarily stop me from not only being able to do the incomplete. things I want to do incomplete, but it, it, uh, you know, I, you know, I certainly, it, anyway, what I was going to say is it didn't really stop me from doing those things or even excelling at them. But, but what I now know from this, having this information from the squat test is that this is something I need to keep an eye on because I know having poor ankle dorsiflexion can impact my balance. And I know as I continue to age, the balance and fall risk is extremely important. And, you know, also there are, I do love to weightlift and ankle dorsiflexion is important for a lot of weightlifting moves. So I think of it as a piece of information that I have and something that I want to keep an eye on. And I know that I'm never going to have the same ankle dorsiflexion as Kelly, but I'm, I also have a benchmark. I know where I am and I definitely don't want to get worse. And and if anything, I want to continue to make micro improvements, but my lack of ability to do this definitely does not stop me from doing the things I love and to do. It's just a piece of information and something that I need to be mindful of as I continue to be an athlete and age. And you can relate yeah. if, if we're worried, someone can't squat hip crease below the knee we don't stop squatting we just modify the squat we squat a little bit higher we give you a spanish squat we squat with a more vertical shin we Hawk squat we right there's so many more ways to squat but we're still going to do the squat i call it the narrowing of the corridor like we're sprinting down this yeah. corridor and the corridor is getting more narrow eventually it gets so narrow you smash into the wall but i like that you know, the whole idea is like we want to keep this corridor as wide as we possibly can so if we can keep the the full range of motion at each joint, then the the corridor ultimately doesn't narrow. But if inevitably as we age or as we get injured or as we become, you know, limited in mobility, the corridor is becoming narrow. And, and at some point you're going to smash into the wall, especially the faster you get going. Um, so I love that really analogy. Different. And that really we're going to be sense. borrowing that if that, you don't mind. That really yeah. highlights oh, like earth. <laughs> when people go out on the, when people go on the internet and they're like, this is your one squat position. I'm like, excuse me? Like, what is your intention? To squat the biggest load? To squat narrow? What if I have to pick something up off the ground? What happens if I have to be in a tandem stance? What if I have to, you know, I, I think that we, we, what we're seeing on the internet is that, man, people move so poorly, have such limited range of motion that, that people are helping them find a shape where they can go up and down with a weight on their back, right? Versus I choose this position because it gives me the most bang for the buck or it solves this problem or I get best hypertrophy for, for the quads, et cetera. And, and we want you to have all of the choice, not just one choice. If, you're, if your hallway is so narrow that you can only walk down it sideways, let's see if we can expand the hallway. I think the other point I wanted to make with respect to this, and you know, we've we've said this on some other podcasts, but you know, one of the things I would challenge anyone listening to this to do is actually set some movement goals mm -hmm. for themselves. You know, we we all not say term not goals. we all save for retirement. It's very common to set personal and professional goals. Anyone who's an athlete has you know set some kind of uh, competition goal and work backwards. But it's interestingly not something we typically do with respect to our movement and our health generally. And so I would challenge everybody listening to this to make a five, ten, twenty five. 50 year movement goal and health goal. And, you know, for us, the, you know, the two things we want to be able to do when we're 80 is mountain bike and ski. Are those two things going to look like they look now? No, we'll probably be riding e-bikes. Um, we'll probably be sticking mostly to the groomers when we ski. I mean, you know, those things will look different when we're 80, but we know that we want to keep that corridor wide enough, you know, open enough so that we can continue to do those things that really bring us a ton of joy. And we want to be able to do those things with our kids and our grandkids if possible. 
And, you know, I would challenge everybody listening to this to sort of actually, you know, take a moment to write those things down because you're exactly right. I mean, I just, I can't say enough how much I love the corridor thing. You know, nobody wants to, you know, get to be 40, 50, 60 and have the corridor be so small that you actually can't do the things you want to do with your body. Yeah, I, I agree. I do something similar. I have physical standards, right? Like, you know, the the level of ease with which I do a yoga pose or a yoga mm-hmm. class and level yes. of ease with which I squat and how much I squat and, you know, the the, the speed with which I run and, and you know, the my, my agility and the lane. Like, yeah, I know, you know, when I'm 40, I'm able to do all of these things. And so hopefully when I'm 45 and I'm 50 and 55, I try to maintain as close as I can to the standard. And, you know, sometimes some of the standards fall below my baseline, but ultimately I, I have a, a subconscious or unconscious record of them all. And if I see them falling too low, I address that. I spend a little more time in that area. That's why I encourage all my clients to, to kind of uh, take a subjective inventory of their life. It's like, hey, here's a strength target. Here's a mobility target. Here's a physical capability target. Here's an athleticism target. They can be whatever you want them to be that suits your life. Just maintain some basic standards. And when you see them start to fall, then you shift more of your focus to that direction. It sounds like we're on the same page. Yeah, we really are. Yeah. And, and you know, just to, you know, bootstrap on top of that, you know, what we should be doing with training is reclaiming, reacquainting ourselves with our bodies every day. One of the reasons that we go to the gym is not just bigger physiology, more physiology gets, to, it's to, hey, I've been, I had a newborn, I had to sit on this red eye, I just ran this 5K, I'm super beat up. I go to the gym to restore and understand what's going on. If, you know, I think there's this real issue now where, training has been sort of really separated from sports performance, which I think is a mistake that now we have this physical culture for physical culture's sake Mm -hmm. that we have, it's recursive fitness. It's sort of doomsday prepping more pull-ups. So I can have more pull-ups. I can have more pull-ups and someday I'll use all thousands of the pull-ups that I can do instead of saying, I I do this to get something, get better at something and use the gym as a way of understanding blind spots, holes, capacities, range of motion limits so that I can actually go out. The problem is that most of us are not really engaged in actual sport. The problem with that is now I have to address the things that I'm not good at. (laughs) I only want to do the really small subset of things that I'm really awesome at and ignore everything else. That feels like a really good plan for my longevity of of physical capability. I I want to deadlift 500 every year for as long as I can. Well, so Kelly that's, touched just five hundred. Uh, Kelly touched. Yeah, yeah, that's an actual goal. Kelly touched on this earlier, uh, and that is the word durability. But I want to expand a little bit on that. We actually don't really love the word longevity and don't care because to us, we don't care if we live to be one hundred and five, but spend the last fifteen years of our life in bed in a nursing home. We have zero interest in it. I don't think. I don't really think anybody cares about you know living long for the sake of living long. I think what people really want is to have. And, and that's why we prefer the word durability. People really want to have a durable body, you know, now and and again, as they continue to age, because what we do know is that, you know, life is going to throw everybody some kind of physical curveball. I mean, whether it's disease or accident or injury or just the everyday yeah. stresses of life, you know, having children going through a bout of depression, losing parents, grief. You know, there's so many things that life is going to 100% throw everybody's way. And to and, and we know from personal experience that having a durable body that we've care, you know, we've cared for and fed well has allowed us to get through those difficult times much better. You know, I had a surgery and people, a bunch of people said to me, wow, I mean, you just heal so quickly. Like, I'm just not like you. I I could never heal like that. You know, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm still like a normal person. I'm not, there's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about my genetics. The only difference is I I have put all this input and care and feeding into my body in advance of having, you know, a, a surgery so that once I did, I was able to sort of weather that and recover more quickly, not because I'm somehow special. It's because of all the things I did in advance of when that, you're the wolf knowing feet. that that would happen one wolf day. <laughs> it's adaptive capacity, right, Juliet? It, it's like, you know, we all have this adaptive capacity and, you know, people like yourself are, you, your capacity to adapt is much greater. And, and so you subject yourself to stress every day. So you don't, the walls don't close in around you, right? The corridor walls don't close in around you. And so if you maintain that adaptive capacity in all the facets of life, when something happens, your ability to recover from it increases. And I talk about four areas of adaptive capacity. You guys are really focused on, at least in your book, physical capacity, right? So we have physical capability, metabolic capability, physiological capability, and psychological 
capability. And those are like your four kind of areas for adaptive capacity. So when it comes to um, building it into your life, Cal, I just love that concept. And it's not going to happen if you don't, right? As, as busy parents, I'm also a busy parent, I'm an entrepreneur in a business and um, you know, doing my best to maintain uh, the physical capability that I had when I was 21, trying to hang on to that as best I can. Uh, sometimes it goes down to like, man, I'm doing mobility work when I'm brushing my teeth or I'm, I'm doing my mobility yeah. work when I'm, you know, I'm on the floor teaching my kids homework and like I'm doing, you know, they're doing math and I'm doing mobility work and trying to help them with the math. But you literally, it's like uh, blending it into your life. So I'd love to have you kind of break down some more examples of how you guys specifically are building these types of routines in your life. Well, I, I just want to say like, cheers to you. That is exactly what we're, I mean, if there's one thing we're hoping people get out of this book is to sort of think about their life and their environment a little bit differently and realize that there are so many things that you could do to feel better that you can literally just sprinkle in to things that you're already doing. I mean, Kelly mentioned just, you know, making the slight behavior change of sitting on the floor while you're watching TV. That actually then opens the door to maybe doing a little bit of mobility work, opening up your hips, you know, it just sort of naturally lends itself to actually spending some time doing some care and feeding of your body. And, you know, but what we, we love this idea of constraining your environment. You know, Kelly likes, Kelly loves cookies and he also loves ice cream. I would say cookies, I'll oh, yeah, ice cream yeah. for him, but he loves cookies. And, you know, what he always says is, look, if I have cookies in the house, I'm going to eat cookies. So let's constrain the environment and not have cookies in the house, because if they're not in the house, then I'm not going to wake up at 10, 8, you know, 10 p.m. and go eat a whole sleeve of, you know, Girl Scout Thin Mints. Right. But but we want to expand that in terms of thinking about how to to move throughout our day. You know, as you can see, we're sitting here at this table. Kelly's sitting and I'm standing mostly just so that we look even in this camera situation. <laughs> but, I'm but, perching, actually. But he's perching on a stool. But, you know, we've set up our environment, not just our office, but also our home in ways that it encourages movement and play. I actually just posted a video today on my Instagram of Kelly playing around on an Indo board, which is like a balance board in our garage. Yeah, and we literally just leave that thing sitting in the pathway where people walk in and out of our house in the garage. And you'd be surprised. I mean, everybody who comes through, whether it's our kids, us, our kids' friends, anyone who comes through just gets on and plays on the Indo board for you know a minute or two. And so we've just really tried to- Wait, wait, I had to go to my Indo board class. Yeah. <laughs> right after my deadlift yeah. class, right after my stretching class, right after my breathing class. So we, you know, we also, I'm sure everybody listening to this has heard of the blue zones, which are those six or seven places on earth where people live the longest with the fewest chronic disease. Well, yep. interestingly, those people don't go to exercise classes. They're not True. going to Orange Theory or hitting the gym. Their their health is so good because they've built in these practices into their daily lives, like walking to the grocery store to get their groceries, you know, yep. just these basic practices that are built into their life. And so I think, you know, if we do nothing with this book, but make people think about their environment differently and think about how they can move more throughout their day and, in, in, you know, doing things they were already doing, whether that's working or, you know, like you said, working on your mobility while you're brushing your teeth. I mean, that's where Kelly and I work on our balance, for example. You know, we love this thing called the Solek test, which is standing on one leg, eyes closed. The greatest time to practice that is while you're brushing your teeth. Everybody's doing that twice a day. You get two or three minutes of balance practice done. It's not, again, this a whole other formal thing you have to add into your day. So we're really just trying to encourage people to create movement-rich environments in their lives and make it really easy to add in, you know, like Kelly said earlier, just, you know, pull these little small levers all day long. And again, nobody is going to be able to constantly rely on willpower and motivation. Like those things are dead to us. We've got to make it easy. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that people run into is at least talking to the audience that that I work with personally, they sometimes accept a low level of discomfort all the time, or they don't even know how good they can feel, and they, they don't yeah. realize how good they can move, and, and the absence of pain, even what that feels like, they're like, oh, I just wake up every day with back pain, or my ankles just hurt every day, and it's like, I kind of look at them with like awe and wonder, I'm like, you sure? Mm -hmm. Like, is this normal for you? You're going to accept this? And they don't choice, get it. You do these like five minutes of mobility, everything feels better and and you guys have just unlocked this this um you know in my mind gift of objective measurements of like hey if you just pay attention to these small number of objective things uh everything can feel better you don't have to wake up every day with back pain or tight hips or neck pain or whatever people are experiencing um so i'd love to have you guys kind of keep progressing us through um some other examples that you guys suggest in the book 
Let me give you an example of something that I sometimes gets lost because it's not very sexy, and that's walking. You know, one of the if you come to see me with for back pain, I'm a physical therapist. If you come see me for back pain, chronic pain, or new onset, you're going to get three things immediately. I'm going to talk to you about your sleep because there's no way I can untangle chronic pain or persistent pain unless I talk about your sleep. I'm going to show you how to breathe and how to get motion and movement into your trunk. I'm going to get you to mobilize your upper back through big breaths so that your neck actually works on your T-spine and your shoulders work. And I'm going to show you how moving the circulation through the lymphatic system of your trunk actually makes your tissues healthier and less sensitized. We get all that motion in. And I'm also going to make you walk. I'm going to make you walk, 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 walk. And for you who's in acute pain or have feel disabled, you're going to get 10 30-second walks around your kitchen counter. That's what you did today. And you held on. You went up and down the hallway 10 times. Tomorrow, you're going to do it 11 times. Then you're going to do it 12 times. And then we're outside. And then pretty soon, we're going to start to scale that up. And what you're going to find is, man, you actually got enough steps that you fell asleep. You got enough steps that your Achilles tendinopathy went away because you decongested your tissues because you dumped your lymphatic system. Turns out you have a better civil society because... You interact with your neighbor. Oh, you yeah, actually oh. go outside and... You your, know, your, your, people. Your, marriage, your, your marriage is better because uh, you and your wife go for a walk after dinner and you talk mm -hmm. about the day and you, you know, and, and all of those things come around for walking. And what we f told everyone forever is like, if you're not lifting, you can sit, you should sit. If you're not sitting, you should lay down. We basically were like, unless you're under some high intensity bar, yeah, you should yeah, or, you know, why walk when you can run. Right. Good Lord. Right. So what we begin to see is no system works by itself and i think that's where we we the complexity message that we're hearing on internets of this supplement and this behavior they don't show me where i'm going to do that and i don't appreciate how interconnected all of these features are and so what we see is that there are very much first principles so we talked about juliet talked about squatting we talked about getting up and down off the ground something that i'm obsessed with is becoming known as the knees behind butt guy. And I want everyone to f <laughs> focus fetishize hip extension. I don't mean standing up from a squat. I mean, getting into a position where your knee is behind your butt, like you're lunging, like you're pushing a sled, something like that. That is the game. Okay, so before we talk more about hip extension, which truly is Kelly's favorite subject, and we could probably have a two-hour podcast just on that, given his enthusiasm. Yes, what, what I want to say, just to sort of close out the walking section of this conversation, is that that has been the chapter we've seen and heard from uh, most of the athletes that we know had the biggest impact on them. So the you know we've shared this book with you know people of all stripes, like from parents to neighbors to you know weekend warriors to professional athletes. And and I think that has been the walking chapter actually has been kind of a light bulb moment for a lot of people who really sort of fashion themselves as serious athletes, realizing that they are doing their training in sport. They probably have some pretty good nutrition habits and, you know, may even be tracking their sleep with some kind of device. But in most cases, people have had this light bulb moment like, man, I am actually not moving enough throughout the remainder of my day. And, and and just sort of realizing that, that that's something that they can simply and easily add in that will make them feel so much better. So that, that one has been a really interesting sort of finding as this book has gotten out in this world is to realize how many, you know, serious athletes and weekend warrior type athletes were like, oh man, I actually am not walking at all. And if you're listening to this, body composition hack. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other thing. They're 10 to 12,000 steps a day. Don't change anything else. You're welcome. And, you know, the re the research is really starting to come out that like the difference between people who are able to control their weight throughout their lifetime and not people who struggle with their weight isn't that one hour session in the gym. It has nothing to do with that. It's your total amount of movement throughout your day. It's how much non-exercise activity you're getting. So, you know, oftentimes it's a big, you know, it's a big rake that sort of gym goers are stepping on thinking that, you know, man, I got this. I went to my CrossFit class, but it turns out you burn like 300 calories at a CrossFit class. Right. You want to hear something funny? The foundation of everything I teach probably for the last four years is three things. Breathe, walk, meditate. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Too easy. No. Everyone listening to my podcast has probably heard me say it a hundred thousand times. Like if you're not doing these three things every day intentionally, you're not ultimately, well, I, want to say, I hate the word optimize, but like, you know, ultimately optimizing everything, right? Because if breathing and walking, you're dysfunctional. Everything you do on top of that is dysfunctional. If you can't meditate, you know, your mind is going to be chaotic and probably not ultimately organized in a way that's supporting the best version of yourself. Those are my three pillars of 
human optimization that that exists at, at the foundation of it. Yeah. You know what's awesome about those three things too is they can also be done at the same time. Same time, totally. <laughs> That's what's also a miracle of them, right? Like again, you don't have to the meditate for an hour and do have a breathing practice for an hour and walk for an hour. You know, you can set aside twenty, you know, three twenty minute blocks in your day to walk and you can practice on practice your breathing and your meditation while walking. It's like a it's a miracle. Let me give everyone who's listening because they're on your tip around this stuff. This is one of my favorite breathing practices that came out of the work, some of the work we were doing with the coaches of the French free divers. So free diving, CO2 tolerance, nerds, I, if I don't hold my breath, I die, that kind of thing. And you can do this while you're walking. You're going to take a 10 second inhale through your nose. And already I guarantee you're going to fail because a 10 second inhale is a really long inhale and you don't have the control for that, but it's going to force you to exhale all the way and then have to. So now we've got range of motion, your diaphragm covered, constrained, and you're going to have to really fill maximally to hit 10 seconds. Then all I need you to do is hold your breath for as long as you can. You can count steps if you want. You can say, I'm going to make it to that tree. Otherwise, I'm going to die, right? You can play all these games. And then all of a sudden, when you die and a little pee comes out and you feel a little woozy while you're walking in your neighborhood with your dog, go ahead and recover nose only and try to get back to baseline because you're going to do it again at the next minute. So suddenly, I will turn that little walk of the dog down the neighborhood into a death-frightening horrible CO2 tolerance drill, and you're going to have to really focus on your breath. But what you'll see is, wow, I can get a lot of work done. And then when I went to train later on that afternoon, my brain was already prepped for higher CO2 tolerance. I'd already done range of motion in my diaphragm. My VO2 max was better. All of those things sort of grease the skids for a better workout later on. And that's for me what it's all about. So I'm holding on the inhale. Uh, hold on the inhale. Yeah. Uh, you know, Wim Hof got us holding on the exhale, but I don't want you to hold on the inhale. Yeah. So, man, this, this is really funny. Every one of my coaching clients is being trained to do 30 second inhales and 30 second exhales. Oh, that's so mean. Right. Well, so, man, I'll, I'll even go beyond that sometimes, but it, the, with the exclusive objective of gaining that diaphragmatic control, the expansion of, of the intercostal, yes. is giving them the ability to, to regain mobility through their upper body, just like you're speaking about. And the the changes I've seen in spinal mobility and shoulder mobility is uh, there's there's nothing that comes close. I'm not sure if, you, if your experience as a physical therapist or a physiotherapist is similar, but like man, I've never seen people alleviate shoulder pain and back pain and neck pain as quickly when they just learn to create expansive breathing practices. Everyone is on the internet right now. Is you know Dave Wack is out there hammering the drums, and we're talking about you know Gre- Grekovetsky's book, The Spinal Engine is back, and people are thrown in each other's faces and you know, the spine is the first engine. It's, you know, we've always described that, of course, if we work in functional training, functional movement is defined as a wave of contraction from trunk to periphery, from core to sleeve, from axillary skeleton to peripheral skeleton. Mm -hmm. So what's the first organization or first movement of the spine? It's not side flexion. It's not, it's not rounding. It's not rotating. It's breathing and expanding. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, it's actually Philip Beach, who describes the sort of intention of the trunk is maintaining, yes, it's moving, but it's maintaining the integrity of the spine. And so everything is a contractile field around trying to maintain the integrity of the spine and comma, stabilize, rotate, generate force, et cetera, et cetera. But the first motion there is the breath. And if you're going to untangle all of these things from headaches to jaw pain to shoulder pain to lumbar pain or hip pain, you've got to be looking at how people are moving their their backs and spines, that's breathing. And beautiful. Now I'm going to look up all those, re- those references because this is something I just landed on on my own. I, I love it. Trying to figure out my own. That's, that's because it's the truth. Yeah. But yeah, it's really cool to hear that you're doing that because, you know, one of the things that we we think is different about the breathing section of our book is exactly what you're talking about, right? It's It's about this, you know, connection between the neck and the back and the spine and, you know, this sort of expansive physiologic part of breathing, you know, not just not just the meditative part and, you know, all the other things that Wim Hof and all the other major experts are, yeah, it's the biomechanics. Like all, all these other experts are talking about, you know, really cool and important things with respect to breathing. And what we felt like we could add, add to this conversation of breathing was the biomechanics part. I went on, I wrote a, um, a breathing course two, two or three years ago and I went on this like six month, just like scouring everything I could on the internet to find people talking about the biomechanic, biomechanical influence of, breath. I was just like 
tried to find everything I could because I was so obsessed with it. I was like, there's got to be someone out there teaching it. And I found a few people out there with like courses and stuff, but it, it wasn't really a predominant focus for anybody. I was like, how can this not be, you know, like some of the best biomechanists I, I had ever spoken to just didn't even consider it when it came to like optimization of movement. I was like, I, I just don't, I don't get it. So I'm glad that you guys are, are making it popular. Shout out to Leo, Leon Chaitao, who passed recently in the last year yeah. and wrote a really important book looking at some of the research around the fact that like when the diaphragm wasn't functioning well, we saw 30% decrease of force to the legs, right? The huge shutdowns that the, the diaphragm accounted for the majority of blood flow during aerobic exercise. That makes sense. So an efficient, functional, non-stiff diaphragm that wasn't tacked down made it more effective. We saw that and it's at, I'll point out the work of Cal Dietz and his triphasic, some of the work he was doing around just mobilizing the, the front of the ribs for people, just that rib cage diaphragm interface, ended up radically shifting people's substrate utilization. Their, their sort of the metabolic pathways they were using, just because they freed up the diaphragm, they were able to breathe more effectively and that shifted the whole system towards an aerobic bias. It's really remarkable. So Cal's implementing some, I forget the name of his system. It's, the triphasic is, is a training modality, but his, his like manual modality that Mike uh, Nelson also teaches. Reflexive re performance reset. RPR. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Are you talking okay. about Dr. Mike Nelson? Yeah, yeah. Shout and, out, shout out. Yeah, I love him. He's amazing. And Cal, yeah, both teaching the, the RPR. That's correct. And that was, so actually Mike treated me on RPR. I didn't realize that they had data on how it imp, uh, implicated in metabolic output. That's interesting. I'll look at that. And more importantly, and this is what's so great about what we're seeing about everyone, when you're hearing experts on the internet, everyone, PSA, I want you to ask yourself, who are they working with? Where are their bona fides? Are they aggregators of information? There's nothing wrong with that. Certainly nothing wrong with that. I love aggregators. I love people who are experts and in fields and who are sort of helping me feed me the, the tidbits and the research. But I also want to know who you're working with, testing and seeing. And that really matters. And that has been lost in this big, you know, fancy internet world where everyone's an expert. What you can see is one of the reasons that RPR and the work of Dietz at all, at all is so important is they're actually working with national level hockey players and yeah. they're working with a whole university and they're testing all of their thinking and, and objectively measuring inputs and outputs. And what you see suddenly is, a conversation for him and that group, that coaching group, is what is the minimum effective dose to have the most impact on my athletes so I can get them out of the gym faster and into their sport faster? Okay. And how can a person do this to themselves? So RPR is super cool and someone does it to you, but you'll be shocked at how they teach athletes to do it to themselves. Hmm. And that is where the magic is, is that a person taking care of themselves in their household is the goal. Brilliant. Yeah. I always say like 95% you know, of people on the internet are just regurgitating information as opposed to actually taking some information, taking some theories, applying it, pushing it to the limit, seeing where it breaks, seeing where it holds up, and then coming back with some valuable insight about, okay, this is what happened at this uh, in this uh, arena, and this is how I can maybe extrapolate some of the value of what I learned and apply it over here. Totally, yeah. man. I totally agree with you. There, there's and, and it's such a gift to be able to work with you know, really any any audience, but specifically high performance athletes, because you know, as you know, if you're not pushing something all the way, you know, pedal all the way down, it's really kind of hard to tell where this thing holds up and where it breaks. It's very true, and it's one of the reasons in our thinking why here we have the components of durability. We think that you're going to go out and and do what you need to do. But the reason we know what we know again is because we work in these high performance environments. That's that's where the test is, where we're like, wow, this is a really cool idea, doesn't scale, not reproducible, can't be consistent with it. You know, like, so, you know, are we going to send LED light beds out with our SEAL teams? So like, we're like, mm, it's probably not going to work great, but maybe that's a technique or a tool that works better at home in when they are recovering. Okay. So, so it allows us to start to sift through some of these pieces. The thing you just hinted at actually is really one of our central ideas is that Unless you can do this thing at high speed and high load, it's probably not as effective. And so what we see suddenly is, look, everyone is squatting on slant boards. Super cool. We've been squatting on Olympic lifting shoes for a long time. We've been sliding plates underneath people's heels for a long time. But 
What is the world record slant board squat? Do you know? It doesn't I, exist. I tell you what, if it does exist, I probably hold it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I, it's difficult to disprove. So I'm sure that you're the world record holder for slant board squats. But Let suddenly what you, you see he suddenly is that, hey, this, Send us the video. this tool doesn't continue to serve me throughout the course of my life. And so for us, and we might say, hey, that's a less effective technique or a less effective tool. Mm. Doesn't mean it's not an, a useful tool, but as we kind of progress, what we'll start to see is that, as Franz Bosch says, there's more variation in waltzing than there is in sprinting. And that's because at waltzing, at low load, low speed, it doesn't matter. Your body can do whatever it wants, mm. but a high load, high speed, boy, it really does start to matter. Sleep starts to matter, nutrition starts to matter, movement, tissue quality, all starts to matter. I think Kelly made a really good point that I wanted to elaborate to. It seems like we really have sort of disempowered people at, at large to be responsible for their own bodies. You know, I can't tell you how many people, you know, we have who, you know, tweak a neck and before they, you know, get into our office have gotten two MRIs, a CAT scan and seen six physicians um, when often, you know, it when often the solve is teaching them how to breathe maybe doing some T-spine mobilization and practicing putting their arms over their head. And so I think we've really sort of- Wow, that was a super like organized, systematic way. Amazing. Thank you. We, I think we've trained people to think like any ache and pain, I've got to run directly to the physician. Yes. Um, you know, we haven't yeah. gotten the message out that there's so much people can do on their on the gym floor or the living room floor to make their bodies feel better. And, you know, and, you know, even I would even go so far as to say, like, one of the things that bugs us the most, you know, we've obviously been standing desks, desk advocates for a long time and not because we're anti sitting and not because we're pro standing. But what we like about the standing desk is it is a gateway to more movement. People who are standing tend to move and fidget and change position more often. And it's easier to, you know, work on your mobility at a standing desk. So that that's why we're pro standing desk. But I can't tell you how many people have said to us, oh, man. I'd love to get a standing desk at work, but, you know, my employer just won't pay for it. And that's like a classic, you know, we've handed off our health and wellness to others. And I mean, to me, the worst person you can hand off your health and wellness to is your employer. They're not responsible for your health and wellness, right? Like that's something that you're responsible for. And, you know, a standing desk doesn't need to be a $7,000 plug-in hybrid amazing you know, piece of equipment. It can be like six copies of becoming a supple leopard with your laptop on top. Right. And so it's it's just interesting to see in, in these different parts of our lives how how we've almost encouraged people and you know taken away their power to manage their own health and do it in the home, which we think is the most effective place. And that's one of the things we're really trying to do with this book is say, hey, you own these things. These things are your responsibility and only you will reap the benefits of having a body that moves well and feels good. And the benefits will be massive if you if you you know keep an eye on those things. Yeah, Juliet, that's such a beautiful segue into what I wanted to talk about. You guys have brought it up a little bit, but you know, so people are so quick to disconnect from their proprioceptive feedback, right? People are so quick to take a pill or you know go see a doctor. Like I need to drink some bourbon. Yeah, yeah, right. And and we call it self soothing. Yeah, and I think the human, uh, the the modern human, is so disconnected from their body that. They don't really know what they're feeling. Like they're not getting enough proprioceptive feedback to know, like, hey, I'm tight here. It's like it's just kind of how I, I exist. It's kind of how I operate. I literally had a conversation yesterday with my team about, you know, the body is orienting itself, the environment, through the bottom of your feet and through your eyes. And most people are put into shoes from the time they're you know, six months old and never get to connect with their environment. And they, their their ability to feel the bottom of their feet is zero. So inevitably, the musculature of their feet and their hips becomes dysfunctional. And you know, how many, how many times do people you know, actually look at themselves in the mirror, like touch their body and see what it feels like to contract? And while muscle, while bodybuilding itself is obviously an incredibly vain endeavor for most people, I think there's huge amounts of value in like standing in, in the mirror and actually watching yourself pose and feeling what it feels like to pose and contract in different positions. And there's a lot of utility in, in connecting with yourself and, and taking some type of subjective or objective inventory of like, oh, that's what that feels like when I, when I contract that. That's what I feel like when I when I you know go into this position and I stay there. I think if we just started with some interventions like that, where people are like, "Hey, I know what my body feels like, and I I can actually tell, I can give you some objective and subjective feedback of when I go into this position, this is what I feel." I think that's like the first step in people starting to really get in tune and and know what to look for and then know what to take action on. Because I mean, just can I can hear some of the audience at home in my mind going, "Well, where do I start with this?" Yeah. 
And so I think the first step is like, hey, pay attention. What is your body telling you? Yeah. And I mean, I think, again, that just goes back to what we were trying to do with this book, which is give people these objective measures, right? Like to the question, where do I start? Start here, take these tests, you know, get, get some information about where your body is and in actually start to feel, you know, st- start to feel and be aware of what things make a difference. You know, Kelly talked a lot about session cost. And I think as athletes, we know what a session cost would mean in terms of a training session. But, you know, we would also think of travel, having a baby, going through a stressful time at work, those things are also a session cost. And so we encourage people to sort of bring some awareness to those kinds of session costs and how how they make our bodies feel. You know, I like when I'm under great stress, I obviously clench my teeth and I get, you know, I, I'm prone to headaches, right? I'm I'm super aware that if I'm under high stress, that I'm, you know, clenching my upper body and and am prone to get headaches. Like that's a connection that I've made for myself. And, and I just wanted to touch quickly on something you said about the, the foot, because, you know, Kelly, in addition to hip extension, is also obsessed with the feet. And there's a few times where Kelly has said something that's broken the Internet. And one of them is suggesting that people might go outside with bare feet and walk around. You know, we have in our book, Ready to Run, we have this thing called Barefoot Saturday, where we suggest that people try to go the whole day without wearing shoes. Obviously, if you need to go to a store or a gas station. Or- and we were like. And you run a mile barefoot and people are freaked yeah, out. freaked out. But I mean, just just the suggestion that people might go outside without shoes on was like it like blew up the internet. And isn't that interesting? <laughs> like, isn't that interesting right. that we've become so disconnected that that you know, even walking a half a block without our shoes on is like a, an internet scandal. You bring that the the feeling, and there's two points I want to make there. Um, one of them is that we have been advocating for people to do their soft tissue work out of the gym for as long as we've been around. We're like, the gym has bands and barbells and all the things that you don't have. So use them there if you have time. Don't want to get in the way of your training. Training and movement is skill and all of that. But what we want to do is teach you to, and train you to be able to do your soft tissue and recovery and adaptation work, and regulation work at home. Because we feel like you can really do that and you have time. You're taking a shower. You're chilling. It'll help you fall asleep faster. But what we found is that if we got people on a regular schedule every evening doing 10 to 15 to 20 minutes or however long they have, but a 10 minute minimum soft tissue work, well, they're already sitting on the ground and they're already watching TV. And so we're like, oh, look, there's the roller. It's right next to you. And then you can ask yourself, what felt, how do I feel right now? What felt tight today? What felt off? What can I connect to? What was painful? What was uncomfortable? What sort of ached? What? Oh, I was on my feet all day long. My feet are killing me. I had to wear these cute shoes at work. It doesn't matter what what it is, but suddenly you've conjoined those two behaviors where you're suddenly like, hey, you're taking stock of how your body felt during the day. And then you have this direct impact in this really kind of coordinated system. What we've done is this disservice where we're like, I took a movement assessment. We're like, really? And how'd that go? And they were like, well, it was super cool. I learned all these things about myself and then I put it in the drawer and I didn't change anything. We want that couplet and that coupling to be even tighter. Today, thing, squat, thing. So suddenly we can use the day as a diagnostic tool. We can use the session as a diagnostic tool. We use a movement as a diagnostic tool. And then more importantly, you're doing it right there as you're talking about putting in feeling. And sometimes we find that we just get proprioceptive input. We get people rolling on a ball and their brains are like, oh, that's not a problem. Look at this input. You know, you remapped that area, that blind spot into your brain just through touch, through self-touch. And that's really, really powerful. I think we've also, especially when it comes to mobility work, I think sometimes people get stuck in the perfect is the enemy of good mindset, in part because, you know, for many of the people we work with, they're like, well, every single part of my body hurts. So like, where would I even start? And I think they're overwhelmed and then don't do anything, right? Or they think, okay, well, every single part of my body hurts, but what's what's 10 minutes going to do? In 10 minutes, I can only, you know, spend time on my calves, for example. But, you know, I would like to just remind everybody this whole idea that we're huge fans of, not just with mobility work, but with every health practice that we recommend in this book is the idea of compounding interest, right? I mean, we've been saying four years, 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. Well, I can see how someone would say, well, man, in 10 minutes, I can only, you know, do a T-spine smash and that's all I've got time for. 
But, you know, if you do a T-spine smash today and, and, you know, roll out your calves tomorrow and work on your quads on Wednesday, and if you actually do that 10 minutes a day, I mean, that's 70 minutes of care and feeding of your body in the form of mobilizations in a week. And if you sort of add, add that week after week after week and year after year, I mean, that's a massive amount of work on your body. And you actually really can get head to toe in a whole week, right? I mean, if, if that's how your brain works, I'm like, start at your neck on Monday and work down to your foot by Sunday. You know, people need a plan, but I think it really, you know, people can't get stuck in the perfect is the enemy of good. You're not going to be able to hit all your tissues at once and make change in every part of your body, but you just start somewhere and move around throughout the days and weeks. And the more often you do it, the better you get at it and the quicker it becomes and the more you become in tune with your body and go, oh, I just need this one. I can know exactly <laughs> what my body needs today. Like I can do it really quickly. Like I wake up every day and I do like jaw mobilization exercise. I'm like, I don't know if I'm grinding my jaw when I sleep, but I'm like, I really feel tight in my jaw. I'm like, once it, once I feel yeah. it's alleviated, everything in my upper body feels better. I feel like I'm breathing so well. Effectively. Yeah, so simple. You know, and when you start a mobility practice, you know, I'll be honest, it can be painful. You know, there's some parts of my body that are super painful and that's also a deterrent. But again, it's one of those things that the more often you do it, you know, the, the more supple your tissues become and the less painful the experience is. So it's, you know, again, the like compounding le- interest, more like a leopard. That's the goal. I, mean, uh, I make coffee in the house during the week. It's what one of my birthday presents to Juliet every year is. He I, says every year, but a couple of years ago, he gave it to me as a lifelong present. And, never, you know, he, he claims that's not true. Never. <laughs> and uh, so I make coffee. And while I'm waiting for the, uh, the, the milk to steam, the espresso to come, I do a standing cat cow. And so I really work on, it's like, a, like a, my elbows are on the counter. I'm holding the milk. I come up on my toes and I do a Jefferson curl where I press up and I do probably 50 of those every morning. I just get my spine moving and I really work on the flexion of my spine. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever told anyone that before, but now- I, I actually didn't even know you do that because obviously I'm not in there. I, while you're doing I'm that. waiting. The other thing I wanted to point out is that every year we end up going up to the river where old boaters and I try to go three or four days, multiple times a year where I don't put shoes on. Mm-hmm. And it is shocking how my, I wear thin shoes, I'm barefoot all the time, but no shoes constantly for four days i start striking the ground differently my yep. feet like i orientate differently i can walk over hot lava but like for the first day not so much like the first day we're kind of like walking you know gingerly and we you know a stone will like gore into your foot and you you know like crouch down but it's really interesting in as little as like 48 hours of wearing no shoes how your foot's all of a sudden like a bomb proof foot you can walk over you anything. don't you don't overextend you don't overstride. like you end up I mean, it's very, it completely changes your gait. And what you'll see is in your shoe, when you strike the ground, most of the time, your shoe is, your foot is flaccid. It is turned off. Totally. And if I have you walk on these hard surfaces, you're going to splay your toes. You're going to create some co-contraction through the foot, like the whole thing. And I'm like, every year I'm like, wow, look at how my body changed when I just started giving it some input again. Guess what? My back feels better. I feel less stiff. It's really remarkable. Well, and also for people who, sorry, one last thing for people who are never going to go walk around barefoot outside, which there are definitely a lot of those people, then we just say, hey, how about don't wear a shoe at your house? The other thing we see a lot is that people have no shoe households, which we're fans of, but often a no shoe household means that they are switching from a shoe to like a squishy, gnarly, (laughs) slidey slipper, which may even be worse. And so, you know, we encourage people like actually be barefoot or wear socks in your own home, like socks or barefoot um you know if you're someone who's never actually going to go out and do barefoot saturday or you know spend three days without shoes like we like to do in the summer yeah so i spend as much time as i possibly can in costa rica and if you guys ever been down there like people Amazing. don't own shoes people don't own shoes in costa rica like you can go you can go to the nicest restaurant and you don't wear shoes you know we you walk on the roads with like the little pebbles and you're like let's get used to it after all they call it jungle feet and you just like you get these calluses in the bottom of your feet where you're just like I, i'll spend three months or longer not wearing any shoes and you come back and put shoes on, and you're like, what are these strange things I'm putting on my feet? And you, I hate it. Like, I walk around like I'm sitting here barefoot right now. I, If I could never wear shoes in big cities, I never would. It's, it's you're, bring, you're bringing up exactly the idea of session cost. What is the session cost of wearing these shoes? It impacts how I move and my, my body's ability to feel. Every year, I'm invited to come to this hi- local high school, Windsor High School, and I lecture to their students in, in their anatomy and physiology classes. They have an exercise science class. It's super cool. And one year they were doing a unit on running and I had, I don't know, like 200 kids in there and I had them all take their shoes off. We did 
27 squat drill, which is really just about maintaining reference foot position, having good balance when you move through a whole bunch of different spaces. We just did some stuff like that. We did a little bit of sort of some like wide balance test stuff. We did a little running barefoot and all of a sudden no one is heel striking. Cadence is over and like, you know, 90. It's pretty amazing. Then I said, okay, everyone put your shoes back on and find those same positions. And every single kid was like, oh my God, I can't feel the ground. My shoes are doing this. They're pushing me over here. These shoes are terrible. Why do we have to wear shoes at school? To a T. Once we just gave those you know, teenagers a little bit of the crack, a little bit of the the input, when they became aware, they were like, well, what shoe doesn't do that? And I was like, you're going to have to figure that out, kids. Can I tell you, Kelly just opened a door for me to tell a funny story also about his speaking at Windsor High School, which I think you and definitely anyone who's a weightlifter listening to this podcast will appreciate. I feel seen and honored. Um, Kelly has a long history of blowing out the butt of his pants. Oh. Um, it started I'm, off- I'm deadlift. Yeah, 500 pound deadlift. It started big, off- Big butt. Uh, things have changed because men's apparel has finally gotten hip to the scene that jeans can actually be made of Sports spandex. stretch. And, you know, things are stretchy. But there was a long period of time where, you know, women's jeans were stretchy and men's jeans took a while to catch up. And so Kelly was speaking at Windsor High School to like 300 kids in what you can imagine to be like a classic, you know, OG high school auditorium. And of course, pops into a full squat blows out the butt of his jeans like i mean i'm I'm not talking a little rip i'm talking like a wide and open you know like you know beginning to end seam blowout and he basically just wrapped a sweatshirt around his waist and continued on see as see kids this is what isn't dangerous yeah and tell you uh (laughs) how many times i've done that so like (laughs) as, as as a big meathead bodybuilder i did i used to wear other pants or the seat of my pants like on a weekly basis, I think, and it's just so embarrassing. And after a while, you're like, ah, whatever. I'm just, I'm just gonna. What's look. amazing is up in Canada, you have you have a lot of people play hockey, mm-hmm. and uh, you can actually get pants made for hockey players. One of our coach friends, Yami Tikkanen, when we were traveling in Sweden for a wedding, he ended up getting a suit made. He's like, this is the best fitting suit because the Swedes play hockey. This this tailor made like hockey butt, and uh, Yami had hockey butt. So uh, I'm just saying. You know, the world has changed. This is a good example of how the environment has come to shape to to fit us a little bit better. Guys, I love this conversation. I want to be respectful of your time. I want you to tell us all about the book, where we can get it, and directly send the audience, everyone there right now to get it. Sure. Go to builttomove.com. You can also buy the book anywhere. You can buy books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's actually live in bookstores, which is fun to see. We also have this thing at builttomove.com called the 21 Day Built to Move Challenge, which is sort of a video companion course. And it's free. Anybody can sign up. You'll get way more out of it if you actually have the book on hand with you as sort of a course. But you know, it's, the goal of it is really just to help people see and envision how to incorporate these things into their busy time crunch lives and includes demos of all the tests and the mobilizations just to, you know, really make it easy for people to be able to follow along with the book and coaches, get as much out of it. Coaches, we have a 21 day free challenge that you can put all of your people through. They enter their email, they get, we made like 80 pieces of content for this thing. It's pretty rad. And it's an easy way to just help people outside of the training session. Amazing. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate what you do. I appreciate the depth of thought and intentionality and practicality that goes into everything that comes out of your mouth and everything that goes into this book. And uh, I know it's going to impact a lot of people. So thank you so much. I, I look forward to making the world a better place alongside you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, much man. for having us. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Thank you for joining me here on the Muslim Intelligence Podcast. Thank you to Kelly and Juliet Sturet. A few points to summarize this podcast, uh, gosh, if they are landing on the same thing as I am after 25 years of working with high performance athletes, you know that success leaves clues. I highly suggest you guys pick up the book, Built to Move. Um, there's a lot of value in this book. There's a lot of value in the wisdom that these people have accrued over the years of working with thousands and thousands of people. And I really love the idea of grinding up your vegetables and spaghetti sauce, so to speak, and building it into your day. Because you know, if you if you have to set aside an entire hour before, after, or whenever, you know, throughout your day, it doesn't happen. It's very hard to get make all the time for all the things, especially when you're doing the heart training, you're doing the cardio, maybe you're doing the the saunas and the ice tubs, and there's a million things you have to choose from. It's really, really difficult. But if you become the type of person who builds mobility, you build movement into your day, it allows you to be successful. Ladies and gents, 
Thanks for being here. If you haven't already left us a review for this podcast, I would love to hear from you. You can do that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. If you haven't already subscribed on those three amazing platforms, please do so as well now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of the Muscle Intelligence community. If you're not already part of our Facebook community, go over there right now and join facebook.com slash muscle intelligence or something they're about. Just search our group. You'll find it. I'll let you in and we will engage in such incredibly powerful conversations. My team is posting in there now. I'm posting in there consistently. We have some really, really valuable um, information coming at you and ultimately trying to get you some deeper insights so you can ch change your life. Ultimately, I want everyone to feel their best and perform at their best so you can show up with the best for what matters most to you, whatever that happens to be. Thanks very much for being here. Live your greatest life and body you love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.